So I've decided to start a new series of uh, discussions on uh, the work of Marshall McLuhan, and this will be the first of those. Uh, I have been reading through a collection of his called McLuhan Unbound that was put out by Ginkgo Press, and here it is in the library edition. The library edition is bound with a spine, but Ginkgo Press put out this series of essays, and each essay has its own is its own uh, text that originally was separate. So each each chapter actually is a, was a, was an unbound separate uh, broadside when Ginkgo Press put it out a few years back, uh, and the library edition conveniently binds it together. I like it better bound. Uh, but what I would like to do the good the great thing about this book is it's, it's an anthology of essays that uh, covers the period in McLuhan's thinking after he put out the Mechanical Bride. Uh, this was a book that he published in 1951 and uh, put that out and then there's a 10-year lag before he puts anything else out. Um, the next book is 1962 with the Gutenberg Galaxy and 64 with Understanding Media. But in the interim, uh, he wasn't silent. He was working his ideas out and he was writing these essays and publishing most of them in a journal called Explorations, which was a journal put out by the University of Toronto. And it, when one goes back and reads these essays, one can see him working out his ideas step by step uh, so that there's not such, a, such a, a great gap between the Mechanical Bride and uh, Gutenberg Galaxy and Understanding Media. Uh, you can see the development in the stages of his thought, and that's why it's worth going back and rereading, uh, or at least reading these essays. For me, this is the second time through them, so I'm rereading them. Um, now, McLuhan uh, was born in 1911 and died in 1980, and his first book, his first great book, was The Mechanical Bride, published in 1951, followed by The Gutenberg Galaxy in 62, Understanding Media in 64, and then his later publications in the late 60s and through most of the 70s, uh, until by 1980. He was pretty much, uh, he was dead in December of 1980, but he was pretty much finished as a writer uh, in the last few years of his life. He um, had a brain tumor and it was removed and then he went for 10 more years after that and then had a stroke and in the last year of his life uh, lost the ability to speak or read. Uh, so he must have had a very difficult time in that last year. Um, <clears throat> so that's the, the main arc of his career. He taught, of course, at the University of Toronto and he basically founded uh, the discipline of what we now call media studies. And media studies is now so common, uh, it's, it's found everywhere and media theoreticians are a dime a dime a dozen, most of them are not very good, uh, and the ones that do tend to be good tend to be more philosophers like Paul Virilio than, than actual media theorists per se. Uh, McLuhan is of course the best of them, but uh, he stood on the shoulders of giants. His work does not just appear fully formed. Um, mainly what he did was read Lewis Mumford and Siegfried Gideon, and the readings of those writers, Lewis Mumford is the, was the great American intellectual who wrote uh, Technics and Civilization, which is the first great book on technology in the 1930s, along with The Culture of Cities and then later The Myth of the Machine, and just an endless slew of books from Mumford. He's another one of our great uh, academics. And McLuhan read him and metabolized him. And then also uh, Siegfried Gideon, who wrote Mechanization Takes Command, and uh, Space, Time, and Architecture. Those are the two big books uh, that influenced McLuhan here. But really the catalyst came with the reading of Harold Innes. And Harold Innes was a fellow uh, teacher, a fellow professor at the University of Toronto. And Innes was a specialist for a while. He put out a number of specialized volumes until he did two books, uh, The Bias of Communication and Empire in Communications. And it was the bias of communication that came out, I believe, in right about this time, in the mid-50s, 53, I think, 51, 51, 52, or 53, and McLuhan read that, and that was the spark that blew up the powder keg and brought to his attention that uh, media themselves are forms that need to be studied and that they shape the sensory ratios of entire societies, including the way in which they configure space and time. And so he's read Innes now, and uh, in the essay that I want to talk about, it's called Culture Without Literacy, and this essay was published in, uh, in, a, in an obscure journal, well, in Explorations, uh, the journal that was published uh, in the first issue of it in, in 1953 here, which was published by the University of Toronto. And this essay is wonderful because it really does act as the overture to announcing all the basic, in, in seed form, all the basic themes and leitmotifs that he would later unfold and unpack through the course of his writings. They're all sort of here packed into this 20-page essay, 
And he starts off in the essay by talking about um, how history is something that is linked with literacy, and that basically all the new media of, in of his time, there were you know radio, uh, the press, uh, TV, um, and movies. Those were the big new media at the time that he was writing this in the 50s. Basically, he starts off by saying that these new media efface historical man and shift have shifted contemporary man into a post-historic mode, and that the reason that they do this is because um, when you take information from all around the world, from every part of the world, and you put it, let's say, inside of a newspaper, then all these disconnected bits and pieces from all around the world make knowledge and information instantaneous. And in doing so, it obsolesces history uh, in creating this instantaneousness, this collage. Uh, in a newspaper, what you have is a collage of multiple times and multiple spaces. But he starts off by saying that this... Uh, this uh, making inf knowledge and information instantaneous manages to take everywhere and every age and make it here and now. So it shifts, uh, the electric umwelt shifts us into a kind of, because knowledge comes at us from all directions at the speed of light uh, simultaneously rather than li in linear fashion, first one thing then another, but from all directions at once, and this is basically what the telegraph did, it brought knowledge in from all over the globe making it instantaneous. When that happens, you shift uh, from a, a linear mode to a nonlinear everything all at once mode, and you get what Joyce said, uh, in what pro Joyce prophesied in Finnegan's Wake is here comes everybody. It's all simultaneous, including the rise and arrival of mass man. And so he starts off by making this point about um, writing essentially, uh, the advent of writing creates history. Uh, it is writing that divorces the oral traditions from the written uh, literate traditions of high civilization. So the moment that you have writing, you have history. You have a civilization because writing uh, creates specialism, which the Neolithic uh, craftsman doesn't have, to, the, or at least not to the same degree. It creates militarism and bureaucracy. It lays the foundation uh, for the creation of roads and uh, a militarized society, a bureaucratic system. You have complex ability to uh, keep records and writing basically what it does is it takes uh, the audible oral speech and puts it into space fixes it in, in space so with writing you're taking space and and fix or you're taking time and fixing it in place in space and the actual process of reading is doing the reverse of that you're translating space back into audible discourse and uh, the other thing writing does too is it divorces man from his surroundings it creates a wedge that um, divorces him from his surroundings and begins to create an abstract mental phase space that begins to shift him into a new kind of cognitive environment that is its own world, its own phase space, and pulls him apart away from the natural world and, and his surroundings. And it definitely divorces him from uh, the traditions of preliterate man, the oral cultural traditions. <laughs> And then he uh, quotes Fraser to the effect, though, that um, what this did was, in creating history, is that uh, James Fraser makes this qu comment that literature accelerates the advance of thought at a rate which leaves the slow progress of opinion by word of mouth at an immeasurable distance behind. So two or three generations of literature may produce uh, more change than two or three thousand years that would happen in a, a pre-literate society. So it accelerates the rate of change of thought. And then so McLuhan adds to that, given then that by comparison with radio, press, movies, and TV, these are much faster, much more accelerated modes of thinking even than writing itself is. Uh, so is it the case now, McLuhan asks rhetorically, that we have to tolerate thousands of years of change every 10 years? And he says cultural lag might not be such a bad thing. There, there may be a, a reason for it. it. The Russians, for example, he quotes to the effect as putting certain stop keeps on the evolution of their literature. The newspaper is deliberately, or at least back at the time he was writing here in the 50s, was deliberately archaic. Um, and so the Russians tried to arrest and freeze this process by putting restraints and limits on it, uh, whereas we in the West have uh, embraced this change and just let it happen. And then he says that um, involved with the loss of memory and the psychic withdrawal of alphabetic cultures then, there's a decline of sensuous perception. Uh, sure, he mentions Sherlock Holmes as a character, the sleuth, who has a photographic memory. This is basically a recapture of the, the memory aspect of preliterate man. Preliterate man has a strong memory, 
and memory is one of the things then that gets effaced. Uh, like Plato says in the famous passage in the Phaedrus, memory uh, is effaced with writing. Writing, uh, as Plato says in the passage, he has his character uh, uh, King King Thamus, and he's talking, uh, and he says, "This discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls because they simply won't have developed memories anymore." And this is indeed the case when we look at a civilization like, say, India, where the entire civilization was an oral tradition almost through the entire course of the civilization. Writing came very late to India, and even when it did come in, around the 6th century BC, I believe, about the same time as it, with Homer it comes in with the Greeks, it was sporadic, and it was used mostly for bureaucratic reasons and purposes. They didn't really write down their epics uh, until much, much later, but it's an enormous, incredible, prodigious feat of memory that Hindu civilization produced, uh, and when the British got there, the reason we have all these Hindu texts is because the British ethnographers then went around interviewing yogis and uh, pandits who uh, could recite these in long, long verses, uh, entire epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, from memory. And when they, they knew they were accurate because they would, inter they would interview different uh, yogis from different parts of India and they would recite the texts almost identically. There would be slight uh, differences, but almost identically. Uh, so that, that's an incredible civilization in, in the case of India where writing didn't really take much effect until very late. Um, so memory is the trade-off. Uh, when you bring writing in, you begin to efface memory. So that's one of the things uh, that happens. Um, so then he uh, goes on to make the point that um, one of the characteristics of, he wants to look at the characteristics then of manuscript culture from 500 uh, BC, uh, from just before the time of Plato down to 1500, that epoch is, is the epoch of the manuscript, which was then obsolesced with the arrival of the printing press uh, in the middle of the 15th century. And the characteristics of manuscript culture are, he says, to begin with, one of the main things about manuscript culture is that it never was completely divorced from the oral traditions. It's still very close to it, uh, especially when we consider <clears throat> the fact that um, the ancients read manuscripts aloud, and the actual act of publishing a book, since books were scrolls at that time, the actual act of publishing a book was simply going into uh, public, at a public forum, and reading the book aloud in front of a public, an audience. That was how a book was published in those days. So manuscript culture did remain tied very closely to, uh, to oral culture. Silent reading is something that only came in later. It came in later with the printed press. A silent reading and solitary learning also. The university system kept for a very long time this oral emphasis and still to this day uh, when you are have to defend your uh, your thesis you do so in, in an oral way with a panel and it retains a vestigial structure of this oral tradition of learning. Uh, so solitary learning is, is something that comes in with uh, the printed page. And he says the um, the manuscript page was a uh, very flexible affair, and it has clo it kept close affinities with uh, the plastic arts and with intricate design and color, so that the medieval illuminated manuscripts look very much uh, like like the, uh, the books in stone of the Gothic cathedrals. They're both uh, a phenomenon that he'll later develop as light um, as light through. Uh, these are phenomena that are radiant with uh, spiritual light. Later, we have the phenomenon of light on with the printing press, where we have uh, we have to read a printed page by having light directly on it. It is not itself illuminated or self-luminous as our video monitors and screens are. Um, and then Joyce mentions that Joyce in Finnegan's Wake uh, creates a modern equivalent to the Book of Kells with a dense kind of layered Gothic interlacings, or rather pre-Gothic interlacings of the Book of Kell what he does with language in that book is something very similar. It's very textural, very kinesthetic, uh, and very dense and complex. It's not based on uh, sensuous, it's not based on abstractly visual values, uh, but more sensuous ones. And then so, <clears throat> so he goes on to talk back, then talk about the characteristics of um, the printed page, and the printed page itself is something that begins to come in now, and it begins to, um, let's see here, uh, glancing quickly at my notes, um, he mentions that it's very hard for us to perceive 
uh, one medium except by means of another. We require the contrast between different media in order to make other media visible. Just as we require metaphor, metaphor is seeing one situation through the lens of another. And that's what art does. The artist is, is someone who has the capacity uh, to see one situation in terms of another. And um, so by contrasting media, what he, what he does is he looks back and he says the mechanical clock laid the foundations. The, it, it, what the mechanical clock did was it created a, 